But before I start the message, let me set it up by asking you, what route did you use to get to church today? What route did you use to get here today? For example, how many had to come down Highway 314? Raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. How many of y'all had to come down Highway 85? Raise your hand. All right. How many had to come down uh, Highway 92? Raise your hand. All right. How many had to come down Ginger Cake? Raise your hand. All right, there's a few. Uh, how many had to take the expressway? Raise your hand. Yeah, I do. I take one of those. Uh, all of us have different routes, different ways to get to church. How many of y'all probably have a back way that nobody knows and you, this, this is your secret way? Yeah, some of y'all have that too. Most of us travel different paths every day of our lives. And we take different routes to work. We take different career paths and routes. We take different educational paths and routes. We, we just don't live in a, in a cookie cutter uh, world where we do everything and experience everything the same. However, though, and I think we'll all agree, all the saints who are in the house here, that we're supposed to be traveling on a common path. Unfortunately, you hear people say there are many roads to God, and that just ain't true. There aren't many roads to God. As we heard in, in some of our worship songs, Jesus Christ says in John 14, 16, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in the, in the passage that we're going to read from Isaiah and our hope, that is in his redemption and holiness is the highway that will connect us to our destiny, we as believers can't take the exits of compromise. We, we can't take the country roads of disobedience. We, Jesus said that the broad way leads to what? Destruction. And so we have to stay away from the broadways or the structures or the avenues of lust or the boulevards of pride. Jesus says he's not one of the ways, not one of the truths, but the only way and the only truth. He says the only way to heaven, the only way to God was through him and the salvation that he offers. So this morning, we're going to look at a word picture that was drawn by the prophet Isaiah almost 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And our text is taken out of Isaiah chapter 35, if you would turn there. And we'll read verses 1 through 10, but... We will focus on verses 8, 9, and 10. Chapter 35, entitled, The Joy of the Redeemed. And, you know, when I read this, in the context of the pictures that I showed you in Africa, in Zimbabwe, isn't this exciting that a dry and parched land could look forward to this day? It says, the desert and the parched land will be what? Glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crock as it will burst into bloom, it will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees, that give way, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. 
Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and pap- papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. In some of you all's translations, it will say the highway of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for, it will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Please speak to us, our Father. Please give us encouragement and peace and comfort that you are the way, that you will provide, that you are peace. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and thank you and love you. Amen. Our first point is, it is the only way to, it is the holy way to hope. It's the only way to hope, but it is also the holy way to hope, our hope in his redemption. Because in verse 8, it says that, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about it. There is hope and redemption, and redemption is what puts us on this highway of holiness. It will be for those, you, believers, who walk that way. The highway that Isaiah wrote about makes its way through the wilderness. Well, what's the wilderness? Well, the Bible Throughout the Bible, the wilderness is a picture of devastation. God created the Garden of Eden, but our disobedience produced a wilderness. The wilderness that's caused by sin. But when you accept that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, when you were lost and you were wandering through the woods, lost without hope, Jesus Christ put you on the highway of holiness with the sign right before you that says, this way home. This way home. And as we know that the wilderness is, is a place of testing, the wilderness is a place of temptation, the wilderness is a place of trials, the wilderness is where Israel was disciplined by God. The wilderness is where Jesus was tempted by the devil. In the wilderness, John came preaching and baptizing to prepare the way for Christ. And in the wilderness, some of us experience today, sometimes you are left with nothing but God's promises. And his promises is that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And this is the only path that's going to lead you through the wilderness that we are traveling on to eternal life is the highway of holiness. Here's the bottom line. If you're a believer, then you'll be walking on the highway of holiness. Amen? However... If you're not a believer, if you're not saved, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you're not redeemed, 
You're not going to be on that highway. Because this road isn't a freeway. This road isn't an interstate. We can almost describe it as a, as a toll road. Why? Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus paid the toll, and the only people who could gain access to the road are those who acknowledged Jesus Christ on the cross and accepted his gift of salvation. If you agree with that, let's give God praise that Jesus Christ paid the price. This is the only road to hope. This is the holy way to hope. It is made of, of God's holy people. It will be for those who walk that way. Are you redeemed? You're on this highway. Have you been ransomed by the blood of Jesus Christ? You are on this highway. Do you walk in God's ways? You are on this highway. Secondly, on this highway of holiness, it is the safe way to hope. It is the safe way to hope. Verse 9 says, Isaiah says, No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. The great promise here is that Isaiah tells us that lions will not lurk alone its course, nor any ravenous beast. The apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert, be alert, saints. Your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. But if you're living in obedience in God's will for your life, then you may hear a growl, you may hear that roar, you know, in Africa, man, one of the coolest sounds and scary, and praise the Lord, they're behind a fence where we go, is the roar of a lion. Sometimes we'll be in, uh, in our sleeping place uh, after we leave the village. And some of the places we go, you can just hear the roar of a lion that just shakes the ground. It's incredible sound. But if you're living in obedience and, and God's will for your life, you may hear his growl, but that's as close as he's going to get. According to Isaiah, the one place that is the safest for you as the believer is staying on the highway of holiness. Don't take the exits of compromise. Don't go down those country roads of disobedience or the broadways of destruction, or the avenues of lust, or the boulevards of pride, stay on the highway of holiness. The lion is not allowed on that highway. You know, those of you who have dogs probably have a leash for your dogs. At least when I'm around, I hope you do. Your lease for your dog grants him a certain freedom. Depending on how long that leash is, that's how free he's allowed to move about. But there comes a point when that dog wants to go too far based on the length that you've allowed that leash to allow him to go. And sometimes he want to go beyond what's allowed. And so he pulls further this way but you don't want him to go that way. And he stretches that leash out so far that he's beginning to get a neck ache because he's coming against resistance. And if he keeps insisting on going his way, his neck is just going to what? Hurt worse. Because you're going to jerk it back this way and you're going to show him who's controlling which direction he's going. Now, I give that analogy just to say to you, according to Isaiah, when the devil wants to mess with you, remind him that he's on a leash. Remind him that he is defeated. Remind him that you are in a safe place. 
Remind the devil that you are on a highway of holiness and that he doesn't belong here. Only the redeemed are allowed here. And when that leash hits the length that God will only allow, guess what? God pulls it back. There's a safe place on the highway of holiness. Now, don't get me wrong. There's, in our Christian journey, we have ups and downs. God does allow things to happen where it's not good in a sense of, wow, Lord, why do I have to go through this? Meaning that there are mountains of trials to climb that we go through in our walk. There are valleys of sorrow that we descend. But we also reminded that the trials of this road is insignificant at our journey's end, as we read in verse 10. And as Paul says in 8.18, that I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. In other words, in our highway of holiness, and it's in its safe place, God puts detours in our pathway. And a lot of times, detours are unexpected. You know, when I go home, I'll travel down Lower Fayetteville Road, and at times, they put a detour right there. And of course, when you see a detour, do you say, yay, I got a detour, yes. I don't think so. Probably say some things that we probably can't say. You're not happy because it's going to take you all the way around and about out of your way to get you back where you want to go. A lot of times they're unexpected. When we drive up on detours, we say that's that's just our luck. But we have to realize in life that most detours occur when construction is taking place. The reason why God creates detours in our lives sometimes is that he's doing some construction in our lives. That he's chipping away at the parts of our lives that don't fit where he's taking us to our destiny. He's chipping away at the things that we aren't ready for it yet. So it's not bad luck that he places a detour in your life. Perhaps he's keeping you safe. The highway of holiness is a safe place. And sometimes there's detours that are unexpected because God is doing some construction in your life. In other words, God is sovereign. God is in control. We have to trust God in our walk of holiness. It's not about luck, good luck, bad luck. It's interesting how we view things from the vantage point of luck in our hope than in God's sovereignty in our hope. And I know it's just part of our culture that we'll say something that has luck in it. You'd be amazed how many times you may include the word luck in your vocabulary. Matter of fact, think of one or two right now that just comes to mind and just tell your neighbor what kind of luck statement that comes to mind for you in any given state. And I hope we're not a sanctuary full of bad luck. Well, let me, let me give you a few just to how prevalent the word luck is used. We talk about being lucky. We say, you lucky dog. We ask people to wish me luck. 
We talk about plain luck, lady luck, tough luck, good luck, bad luck. We even say rotten luck. Lucky stars. How about lucky charms? <laughs> and, and when we don't know what food that people are going to bring to an event, we wind up with potluck. <laughs> but God says you're in a safe place, not because of luck, but because you are redeemed And because of his sovereignty, your journey of ups and downs, as long as you stay on the highway of holiness, you are safe. And don't try to figure God out. Don't try to figure him out. Just keep your eyes fixed on him. Just stay on the road and follow him. He is the ultimate GPS. And when I came from the south, um, I got a text and said, GPS in this context means God's protective service. Yeah, he, he's the ultimate GPS. And you can't Google everything God is going to do in your life. That just doesn't work. Romans 11.33 says, his ways are unsearchable. You can't sit at your computer and Google God's ways and get the intricate details of how he does, what he does, when he's going to do it in your life. The only thing that you can figure out is what he decides to tell you to do or what he decides to tell you. And that's why we have the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth. I mean, it's just like you and your kids. You're only going to tell them what you want them to know. But one of the best examples in the Bible that I love, a person staying on the highway of holiness who was kept safe, who had his ups and downs, was Joseph. He was in a beautiful coat one day, and he wound up in a pit the next day. He's got a good job one day, and he's accused by Potiphar's wife the next day. He's in prison. He's forgotten. He's remembered. He's going through some stuff on this highway of holiness. And it looks like he's got good luck. It looks like he's got bad luck. But in actuality, in God's sovereignty, God was in total control. God is the master weaver of the good and the bad. God doesn't endorse evil. But the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, that he can make all things to work together for good of them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. And Joseph even said to his brothers in the last chapter of Genesis, he says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God's in control, folks, in this highway of holiness. Joseph basically told his brother that you tried to mess up my life on purpose. You planned to sell me as a slave. You planned to tell my daddy that I was killed by an animal. You planned to ruin my life. And I don't know about you, has there been anybody, is there anybody here where somebody just intentionally stuck their foot out in their life to try to trip you up, to try to mess you up, to try to knock you down, to try to discourage you. But God says, they mean it for evil, but I could use it for good. You see, even Joseph's father, Jacob, thinks Joseph is dead. Benjamin, his son, is being held hostage by Joseph. They're getting ready to lose Simeon. They are hungry because of the famine in the land. And Jacob, like many of us, 
when everything is going wrong, he threw up his hand and he says, all these things are against me. You ever felt like that? That nothing's right, that everything's wrong, and whatever's broke gets more broke? All these things are against me, but little did they know, in God's sovereignty, in God's plan, and God's keeping him safe on the highway of holiness, Joseph was fine. He was the prince of Egypt. Benjamin was fine. Joseph was taking care of them. Simeon was fine. And they were all, all the brothers getting ready to go up to Egypt and eat. You see, you never see everything that God's doing. You only see the peace that he wants you to see. And you say, why don't he just show me the whole thing? So that you can learn to walk by faith and what? Not by sight. Jesus Christ is our only hope. He is. He is our ultimate conductor. And the reason why I say it, conductor, have you seen an orchestra when they first come out to play? You know, a couple of times we went to Symphony Hall to, to see the orchestra play, the symphony. And the most interesting thing is that when they are all warming up, when they first come out, it sounds kind of crazy. And it sounds noisy because all these different sounds are going on at the same time. Everybody is, is warming up. So there's sounds all over the place. There's no harmonizing. It's cacophony. It's discord. It's dissonant. It's unpleasant. It's noise. And all of a sudden, the conductor walks out. He stands and pulls out his stick, and he taps. Pip, pip, pip. And everybody sits up in their chair. And then he starts. And all of a sudden, the sound comes together. Before the conductor showed up, everything was random, disconnected, discombobulated, non-harmonious. But when the conductor comes up and he taps a couple of times and waves his hand, what looks like sounded like chaos is now making sense. So I'm using that analogy, saints, that Jesus Christ is our conductor. It's not in a political ideology. It's not in a cultural experience. It's not who you are, where you're from, how you were raised. Our hope is in the redemption blood of Jesus Christ, and he and he alone is the way. If you believe that, let's give God praise. You say my life is in chaos. Let's keep our eyes on the conductor. Our country is in chaos. Let's keep our eye on the conductor. My family is in chaos. Let's keep our eyes on the conductor. Let's wait for the conductor because when he shows up and he's going to show up, he is the only one who can bring harmony out of discord. So New Hope, let's not give up. Let's stay on the highway of holiness. God has his hand on this place. I'm so proud to be at New Hope because this place looks like heaven. This place looks like our community. This place God is using in a mighty way, not just in our community, but all the way over shores, overseas, in Zimbabwe and in Wales and Honduras and Thailand and right here. And we know it's not easy. It, 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 it's not easy when you're multicultural, multi-generational, international, multi-county. I mean, we are a multi-everything. <laughs> but that's okay. We all on one common path, and that is the highway of holiness. Lastly, it is the heavenly way to hope. Verse 10 says, and these the Lord has rescued will return they will enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. 
God's highway of holiness will ultimately take all of us, all the believers, to their heavenly home, to our divine residence. Jesus himself said in John 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to a place to prepare for you? And that means we got work to do. There are a lot of people out there in the wilderness as we're traveling the highway of holiness that need access and God uses us to bring him to faith, a believing faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says there's plenty of room. Our ultimate destiny as believers is to be in God's presence forever in heaven. Praise the Lord. But God has a destiny for you here in this life. A destiny in the life we're in right now. A purpose for your existence. The reason why we aren't taken to heaven at the moment you become a believer because there's a purpose. On earth, he desires you to fulfill. There's a reason why you're here. It's not just to go through the motions. There is a God-designed stamp on your life where he is taking you right here. So when you see the sign detour, When you see that detour sign, just be reminded that he rarely ever takes his children to their destiny apart from detours. He rarely takes them to A, to B, to C, to D. We would love that. We would love that easy road, that easy route. No, he takes us from A to F, from F to B, and from T to Q, and and you never know what letter he may pull up next. But part of experiencing your destiny on our highway of holiness is understanding detours. They're God's divine design to contribute to our construction and our preparation. When you see the yield sign in your life, let it be a reminder to let God direct your paths. When you see the stop sign in your life, stay away from sin from those and even those who pull you away from God and anything that comes before God in your life. And when you see a caution sign, it's not clear ahead. There is fog of indecision. Turn on the searchlight of the Word of God. Spend time in prayer and find the right direction. And when you see the no passing sign, don't get ahead of God. Let the Holy Spirit direct your every move so that you're not wondering where God is. Now, we may be traveling different roads to go back home, to go to work, different career paths, different educational paths. We have different hobbies. We like different music. We have different gifts. Like I said, we are different. We are multi, multi, multi cultural. We, we're just different. Some of us like football. Our senior pastor likes rugby. <laughs> Isn't that cool? But that's okay because as believers, though, we're traveling on a common path, and that path is the highway of holiness. That is our hope. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so this is a time where Woo, we have a lot to pray for. And I pray that uh, we come right now and let's fill up our, our, our altar and let's just seek the Lord and let's pray for reconciliation for our country. Let's pray for peace. Let's pray for salvation. Let's pray that God's people, the redeemed, will stay on the highway of holiness. Let's pray for our leaders. Let's pray for our law enforcement. Let's pray for our military. Let's pray for our mission teams who are sharing the gospel all over the world. Let's pray for our community. Let's pray for our nation, our family. Let's pray for our pastors, our church leaders. Let's pray that we don't give up as a church giving new hope to those who need new hope. 
So let us all stand. And as...